Yes, you can occupy po the plant seeds or the seeds here po. The Central Bicol State University of, of Agriculture aimed to generate and utilize new knowledge and technologies and to intensify internationalization and resource generation initiatives through collaboration with the different prestigious universities across the globe and to the various potential organizations and agencies. And part of attaining this goal the university organized and spearheaded this cacao festival with a theme, strengthening entrepreneurial and networking capacity of cacao farmers and processing households in the Bicol region, Philippines. With this, I would like to extend my warm welcome to all our participants, professors, and especially to our university president, Dr. Alberto Anna Perry, Campus Administrator, Dr. Celerino Lizol, to the project leader of this event and currently the Vice President for Research and Innovation, Dr. Ramona Isabel Ramirez, to Dr. Washam Shoditen, who is from Gent University, and to his other colleague, to Dr. Jennifer M. Ibona, Dean College of Engineering, Engineering and Food Sciences, to our faculty from College of Economics and Management, to, uh, to our faculty from College of Engineering and Food Sciences, students, food experts, friends, cacao farmers or growers, experts, good morning to everyone. Good morning. We appreciate you taking time off your busy schedule to join us today. By the way, I am Sheila, your lady for uh, your lady of ceremony for today's event. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this seminar on sensory analysis, explicit and implicit aspects of food experience. Please sit back, relax, and learn. To formally begin the program, may I request everyone to please rise for an opening prayer to be followed by the singing of the Philippine National Anthem through an audiovisual presentation. Our dear Almighty Father, we express our sincere gratitude for the gift of another day. We ask forgiveness for our sins, for which we lay our regrets and sorrows. Thank you for your overflowing and unending patience, kindness, and love that you shower us every day of our lives. Today, as we gather for this special event, we humbly seek your divine providence to help us share your grace to others. Help us engage in meaningful discussions by giving us wisdom, understanding, and guidance. Help us learn and grow and love one another 
so that we can become better children of yours. Amen. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. To give us an opening remarks and to introduce our participants, ma'am, let's give him a, a let's give her a round of applause. To our visitors from the University of Ghent, Dr. Joachim Shotiten, and our uh, the, his colleague, um, Mam Liv de Luruel. We also have our visitor from uh, Central Luzon State University, Sir Joel Kubinal. To our campus administrator, uh, Dr. Celerino de Sol. To the Macau team members who is behind this activity, to the faculty of the university, particularly from the College of, food, of, uh, College of Engineering and Food Science, and to the College of Economics and Management, to our friends, the, farm, the cacao farmers from Milaor, to our dear students, to our colleagues in the university, particularly the research and innovation center directors, to all the staff who are behind this event, working uh, tirelessly from the to the representative of the Extension Services Division. Good morning. This activity is in connection with the implementation of our project in cacao, which is entitled Strengthening Entrepreneurial and Networking Capacity of Cacao Farmers and Processors in Bicol, Philippines. This is a project which was conceptualized by our friend from CLSU when, she, when he was in the University of Ghent as a scholar from the Philippines. And fortunately, CBSUA was chosen as the partner university. This project specifically has an objective to uh, enhance, to help in the development of cacao industry in the Bicol region so that our product may be at par with uh, the best in the Philippines and hopefully in the world. This project particularly caters to cacao farmers and small or household processors. This will, the project has an activity that capacitated 
our farmers and processors in terms of cacao production and good agricultural practices. They were also capacitated in terms of uh, the product development so that our tableya in the Bicol region will be elevated into something that will be uh, more competitive in the market. And lastly, we also have activities that will help them enhance their entrepreneurial capacity. The project is about to end, and this Cacao Festival is somehow the culminating activity of the project. But CBSUA's commitment will not end in the ending of the project. So today, we are having this activity, a seminar that would be facilitated by our resource person from the University of Ghent, so that we can also offer the knowledge and expertise that he has so that we in the Philippines, particularly in CBSUA and in the community of the Bicol region, would be able to benefit from said expertise. So without further ado, me as the project leader of the research and extension project that we have, I welcome you all to this event and hopefully I will also take this opportunity to invite you to also be with us tomorrow in the event of the Cacao Festival proper, where there will be many exhibitors that will be sharing the event. So welcome, and may we have a fruitful experience this morning. So the participants has already been mentioned, but may I uh, officially um, declare that this seminar will be participated by the faculty members from the College of Economics and Management of CBSUA. We also have the faculty members from the College of Engineering and Food Science, particularly the food and technology uh, department faculty. We also have our dear students and our guests, which uh, our guest farmers from Milaor. Thank you for your presence and God bless us all. Thank you, BP Monet, for that opening remarks and the presentation of our participants. At this moment, I think we are all geared for today's webinar, and our participants are all eager to listen to our speaker. But before that, let us call on Professor Joel to introduce to us our speaker this morning. Let's give him a round of applause. Good morning to everyone. Uh, I bring you warm greetings from CLSU in Nueva Ecija. It's much warmer there. Uh, and uh, it's my honor to introduce to you our special guest lecturer for this morning. Uh, our uh, special guest is um, a lecturer and researcher at the Faculty of Bioscience Engineering at Ghent University in Belgium. So um, he obtained his PhD in Applied Biological Sciences, major in Food Science and Nutrition in 2016. And he has been working at the Division of Agri-Food Marketing and Chain Management in the same faculty since uh, 2016. 
He is a prolific researcher with more than with almost 40 high impact publications um, in uh, Web of Science index uh, journals. He is also involved in writing and managing and implementing um, European funded projects uh, at Ghent University and different parts of the world, uh, such as Horizon 2020 and also Interreg Europe and Erasmus Plus. Um, on a personal note, he has been my master thesis supervisor uh, during my master's in Belgium and up to now. Uh, he is also my supervisor uh, in my PhD research, and he's a very, very helpful and uh, very helpful and intelligent guy, I must say. And he is an expert in sensor analysis and consumer science. And I cannot wait uh, to, uh, yeah, to introduce to you and also to and let us welcome with a warm CBSUA applause our guest lecturer, Dr. Joachim Schauteten. Okay. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you also for giving me the opportunity to tell a bit more about uh, my research. Um, for the lecture of today, it's uh, mainly focusing on the research that I have performed during my PhD, um, also in the hope to inspire some of the people here present to also pursue a PhD, I would say, and to also try to do the best um, for having research and also trying to valorize that research. Um, for the people that were also present here yesterday, um, you've already told it, but for us uh, in Belgium and also for yeah, research in academics uh, and lots of Western countries, it's quite important that you try to publish your research in yeah, high indexed uh, journals Indexed is normally, at least uh, in our country, but also in lots of other countries, indexed in Web of Science. So that's something that's important for us um, on one way, because uh, for us it shows to the scientific community what we have done so that other people can learn from it. On the other hand, it's also, but it's more locally, but also you know, in other countries, it gives some yeah, input also for budget that is allocated to the universities based upon the publications that you have. So some universities, like our university at Ghent, gets uh, more money from the government if they publish more in those kind of, uh, this kind of uh, journals. Um, lastly, also, it's, yeah, I already told you, it's important for the scientific community to, to see what you have done, that they can also learn about it. But I think it's also uh, yeah, important for, for yourself that you have the idea that, okay, more people know about your research, you know what you have done. It's a kind of a good for your self-esteem if you can see that people are, have learned from it and are like building further upon the work that you have done. So it's also good so that you know that you don't, I would say, make research or perform research that just uh, yeah, 
a project, you do something, it's nice, it's interesting, you get nice results, but in the end, and that's how it used to be also in Belgium, like up to 25 years ago, um, there's a manuscript and it just is uh, gathering dust in the shelves and nobody knows it. And yeah, it doesn't really help to advance science. So um, that's also something I would like to stress for us. It's really important to publish those results, but there are like, I already mentioned it, multiple reasons to do that. And also for my PhD, and you will see uh, in the meantime, also after I've graduated, uh, everything has been published. And I'll also show you like the, the titles from the publications um, when it's uh, relevant. Okay, so today I will tell you a bit more about sensory analysis and also the explicit and implicit aspects of food experience. Um, and that's a little bit of the, the topic that I will discuss today. And that's of course related to my PhD. So the first thing I would like to introduce you, you to is to food product experience. What does that mean? Um, because it's quite a broad term, but it can also be more seen as a more vague term. So food product experience, um, if you see it scientifically, based upon other research, there are like two parts of it. On one hand, for food products experience, you have the sensory properties of a product. For instance, um, I don't know what's in the snack boxes of today, but yesterday it was a, a kind of a uh, lasagna that was here. So you have then the, the sensory properties. It's like then the tomato, uh, tomato sauce, uh, to which extent uh, it's sweet, for instance, it's sour, uh, the cheese, is it greasy or not? Uh, and those kind of things. So the sensory properties of the product, that's one hand. Another thing are conceptualizations. Conceptualizations can be divided into three subtypes of conceptualizations. First of all, emotions. Let's say you have the lasagna from yesterday from our snack box. How does it make you feel? Are you happy if you, if you consume it? Are you glad? or are you a little bit yeah, worried or uh, have feelings of um, indulgement maybe? <laughs> because yeah, you're thinking about your weight and it's like a big portion of lasagna, although it's nice, you think, okay, I can gain some weight. So it's, it's, there are different things that are possible there. Another type of conceptualizations are functional conceptualizations. Functional conceptualizations, it's really related to the, uh, to the yeah, to the, product that you consume and the functions it has. For instance, uh, okay, for you, it might be quite winter here or getting uh, more uh, a lo lower temperature, but for me, it's quite hot. So if I see a beverage, it can be for me really like a refreshment. So it has then the function of being refreshing. Um, other thing is if you see like uh, a piece of uh, mango because you really like mangoes here, uh, it's also the first time I had the experience to really have fresh mangoes uh, to, to consume. Uh, and it can see yeah, as something that is nutritious, that gives you yeah, a feeling of yeah, being filled. So that's also kind of a function, functional uh, attribute, I would say. And the last conceptualization type that you have is abstract. Abstract conceptualizations is like, okay, a food product is in our eyes, it's expensive or it's cheap. Um, so attributes that doesn't have anything to, may, may, to do with emotions, but functional are normally abstract. So um, yeah, those are the three things. For my PhD, um, if you're doing a PhD, the idea is that you master a lot, that you really become an expert, but in a small, tiny, piece of research. So it means that when you are finishing your PhD, normally then you are in front of a jury or some other person that will interrogate you, that in the end, because you have studied three or four years, some countries it's three years, in Belgium it's four years, that you master the topic more than the person who is on the other side of the table questioning you. So you can convince that person that, really, that you're really worthy of being an, yeah, a person who has a, DHD, a PhD degree. 
but because it needs to be tiny and you have also a limited time of studying things and doing research during a PhD, you need to have, of course, the focus. And yeah, because those conceptualizations, it's quite a lot. I also needed some focus and I focused on something that was quite popular when I started then and also building a little bit further up on my master thesis and that's here, the emotions. You might then ask why would I care about emotions? Why should a food company care about emotions? Well, it's something that can help you to also better market your product. Some food companies have already performed research about it before I even started my master thesis or my PhD. And I already knew that in advance. So of course, those bigger food companies, they often have quite a big R&D team all across the globe. And they know what, what works and they often find new things, sadly, because they're companies that are driven by profits. Um, and they, of course, don't share us what, what they find. Um, sometimes they do, they give some limited uh, insights at conferences, but most of the yeah, information that they have, they see it as a kind of a trade secret because also they have invested a lot of money in that. So they would be a bit stupid to give that advantage to direct competitors. So, but also like what you can see here, an example, Coca-Cola, I think it's all quite well known, although I think it's also a country where here quite a lot of people drink Pepsi. Um, Coca-Cola also has found that uh, before even that those emotions uh, can be interesting. The conceptualizations even also broader because they have launched then already quite a time ago um, a focus on that Coke equals happiness. And so the idea then is by marketing that people are linking that to when they drink a bottle of Coke and that they have the feeling of happiness and that they associate that and that they're feeling like more happy when they drink it. They still do that, but at least in Belgium, you see that they're also working on other conceptualization, the functional one, and also more and more refreshments during summer. So also like, okay, a bottle of refreshments, uh, that's something that they're targeting next to the happiness during summer. Okay. So I, I focused on emotions for my PhD. And emotions, you can measure that uh, with two different types, either explicit or implicit. Explicit means that you will ask the participants of your study to describe by themselves which emotions they experience. There are quite a lot of different tools for that. Um, we have different types of questionnaires, standard questionnaires, questions that are uh, specific for a different product. You can work with words, you can work with emojis. You have even uh, animated cartoon figures, the Primo scale, so there's different kind of methods that you can use there. Um, but just if the person needs to tell by themselves what they feel after consuming a certain food product, it's an explicit method. But of course, there can be some bias there. It can be that persons tell you something, but in the end, they don't tell the truth. Or it can also be that they are not able to bring under words what they feel because it's, for instance, subconscious. And that's why there's also another type of methods, and those are implicit methods. Uh, there are different kinds of implicit methods, like there are different kinds of explicit methods to study more emotions. There are a couple of examples here listed. Um, a first one, um, it's the EEG. So it's me measuring the brain waves and then trying to connect that to how persons feel and experience food products. Another one is here is like face reader. So based upon the face, they try to see a little bit on how people feel. And then another one that is listed here is like a galvanic skin conductance. So based upon yeah, the sweat, I would say, uh, they can also see uh, yeah, or try to have an idea about what products lead to 
the, you have also some more methods there for implicit, um, like heart rate and so on. But it's just an example of the ones that are often used. You should know, we did a study already, I think for my colleague Sophie Lagas, four or five years ago, a big literature review where we had an extensive search for all the literature that has been yeah, made about emotions. And then we examined also in her uh, publication, her review paper, to which extent do the methods work with explicit methods or with implicit methods. And roughly more than 80% work with those explicit methods and only 20% work with those implicit methods. There are different reasons for that. Um, one thing is that those implicit methods are quite interesting, but you also need often special yeah, materials or infrastructure to perform that kind of thing. Another thing is also that it's not always easy to apply it. Um, like my colleague, colleague Sophie Lagast worked with different beverages and also used certain of those methods. But uh, from the moment that you take a sip and then you, yeah, it goes through your, uh, yeah, I think the slug that I'm thinking about the word, but the moment it is slick, then there's noise and I cannot measure anything anymore. So it's really difficult then to work further. You can also there, for instance, with EEG, you can only work with beverages because the moment you chew, there's also noise and you cannot measure anything anymore because then different parts of the brains are higher than the emotions that can be evoked by, yeah, by just the food product. So it's not that easy to work with those kind of methods. Uh, and that's also why, it's, yeah, why I opted to focus on those explicit methods uh, during my PhD. So those implicit methods are quite interesting. Um, but at the moment, there's still quite some limitations there. And I think it will take some time also to overcome those limitations. We're trying to examine those also, those methods. Um, we also just uh, applied for a grant also to have some new infrastructure to, to, to combine all those kind of methods in your research. But it's not that easy to, to do. So it's sometimes easier to work with another thing with explicit methods because then you also know, okay, how do people experience it by themselves? And at least if the, we think that people will tell the truth to us, um, you will know what they think about it. Well, the implicit methods are subconscious, so you don't, they don't always know what is happening in their body and what they are, which reactions, I would say, of their body are taking place. So that's also the reason why I focused on those explicit methods during my, during my PhD. And now we're looking more also for the potential for implicit methods, but it's not that easy, so it, it might take quite some time also to truly really master that. I think, yeah, uh, Maybe in 10 years, there might be sufficient scientific advantage and advantages happens with those methods, but at the moment, it's not that easy to, to work with. Okay, so you can see here, um, yeah, the cover, I would say, from, from my PhD. My PhD was about information and context effects on consumers' food experience. You see here a person, it's not the younger version of me, it was so, just a person where I, I bought the license for to, to, to use that, uh, that figure, uh, yeah, I would say, uh, on the cover, uh, and also to use it like in, in this kind of presentation, so the license also covers that. But I found a nice piece of cover because I was working on the sensory part and also on emotions, so... You can see also here there are different terms mentioned here, like crunchy, uh, sweet, sticky, yellow. So all related to popcorn. So those are sensory terms. But also emotions that you can feel normally linked, for instance, to that popcorn, like enjoyment. You can feel enjoyment. You can feel happy, but also guilty. And the reasoning behind this picture that I had is it's a little bit like companies, but also for us, for, for food scientists. It's about balancing those different both attributes and emotions when you're developing new products. So you want to find the balance between everything. So that's how I also liked a little bit the picture that everything is a little bit in the air and you try to have the optimum, optimum uh, combination of everything. 
why is it important? Um, I will tell a bit later on it, but think about food, uh, I would say challenges like obes obesity. And it's of course important that you're able to balance everything so that you have both a healthy product but that people also like it and don't dislike it because it's just healthy. Okay. So um, let's start and, and make this a little bit more interactive. Um, a question I often ask also is how many of the products do you think that fail? So that means that products are launched by food companies. They are hitting the shelves in the supermarkets. And after one year, how many of those products are no longer in the supermarkets? What is the percentage of that? So, uh, and I hope to have at least five answers. Um, so I'm looking here uh, to the people here in the audience to give me some answers, yeah? Which number do you think, how high or how low is the product failure rate of food products? I know it's quiet here. There's no good or, or bad answer here, so I want to have at least five, five numbers and then you can go further, otherwise, you might sit here until it's night. Um, so who dares to give me a first number? What is the product failure rate? There should be at least somebody that dares to say, yeah? 10%, so that means that 10% is no longer in shelves after one year, okay. Any thoughts about that? Somebody goes lower or higher? We used to have also a game on national television about high and low with, with cards. Uh, American uh, then uh, wins some big prizes. So we have 10%, that's one answer out of five. I'm looking for a second one. You? Yeah? Um, sometimes, sir, I read it from, I read it from the blog. It says that only 2% of the new fra food products succeeded and the 90% of the new products are failing. 98%. Okay. Okay, so from 10, we go to 98%. <laughs> so that's quite a big difference. Other IDs or numbers? I think there are lots of smart people here, so I think everybody can think. How many products do? 70? 70 to 80? Yeah. So, what do you say? Yeah, okay, it's indeed, if we have the numbers from market research agencies and so on, because they keep track, of course, of everything in the Western countries, uh, depending on the source, it's 80 to 90% that fail. So that means that food companies are investing a lot of money on first R&D, so research and development of new products, you need to pay persons, you need to yeah, try things out, see what works, doesn't work. And next step, with the product that I think will be nice for the market, they go to the market, but that means that they need to produce it, set up yeah, transportation, uh, whole distribution channels. Then they also need to make sure that it comes to the, to the market, to the supermarket shelf, so they, it needs to be also yeah there in the shelves and to negotiate with those people and to look for also for some marketing so that people know that that new product exists and for what because eight to nine times out of ten it's just a waste of money well we know from research 
that those kind of innovations, the fact that you make new products are critical for a food company to survive. So innovation, and I assume your vice president might uh, hopefully also acknowledge that, is crucial on the long-term uh, long survival of companies. And of course, as a food company, in innovation entails yeah, launching new of reformulated products, like reformulated, like having products with like a lower uh, caloric content, so that's a little bit uh, uh, lower in energy. So that's an, uh, an example, or lower fat content or something like that. So that's crucial for food companies if they want to survive. But if they then try to do it, it seems that a lot of food companies fail in launching their new products successfully. Although it's crucial for them if they want to survive on the longer term. Luckily, there's an answer for that that can help to reduce that failure rate. And the answer is the expertise of using sensory evaluation. So running sensory tests will help to reduce those numbers of failure rates. There we also have numbers from market research agencies that perform, of course, those tests. Of course, they are quite, quite a little bit biased because they need to sell uh, their, their, their work, I would say. But we see there, if they, or they claim, if there are sensory tests performed on food products and they use that as an input to decide with which food products will be launched and which not, that we can lower that failure rate from 80 to 90 percent to 60 percent when yeah, tests are taking place in a sensory, a sensory lab environment and even lower it to about 30 percent if you have the sensory tests performed at the location that's quite, yeah, I would say natural for people to consume that food product. For instance, if you have pizza, that you let people consume that and do the sensory evaluation in a pizza restaurant or at home with, with family or friends instead of a sensory booth where it typically takes place. So it shows also why it might be important to do this kind of research uh, because we're able to drop those rates and it also means of course for companies that they have a higher chance of success and I don't know the prices here but at least in Belgium the prices for performing those kind of sensory tests for their food products it's um, yeah of course it's still a price that they need to pay to do it with the market research agency but it's quite minimal compared to the cost of having a launch of a product that fails in the market. So the sensory evaluation, that is normally how a kind of an evaluation room takes, looks like. There are separate booths and every person are yeah, performing a test just here in, in the booth so that they have no interaction with, with anybody else. And then there's like here a, a hatch and food products can be going through or sometimes there's no hatch and there's just a, a technician bringing here the samples and then giving to a person so they can just uh, evaluate it them there by themselves. And there's a kind of a way for them to give their input. It can be the paper-based, but nowadays, at least in, in lots of uh, institutions uh, and, and companies, it's computer-based because that works a lot faster also with the data analysis and so on. The measurements then, how do they traditionally measure a product if they ask something uh, to consumers. They typically work with one scale and that's the overall acceptance or the hedonic liking. So they ask participants of a test, how much do you like? And then we can mention the sample number, so sample 142. So it's always a three-digit code that we normally work with uh, in sensor analysis because it has been shown in the past that's that kind of code, uh, three-digit code, doesn't lead to a psychological or mental bias. And then you have this kind of scale from one to nine, going from dislike extremely 
to like extremely. So that's how it's typically done. And that's also the scale that has been most often used if you go to scientific papers for sensory research. However, I told you already, although we use those kind of scales, still products fail. So that means that in a traditional way, we don't capture everything that plays a role in how people make their choice of food products. So there's more than the, just this. And that was also a little bit um, the reasoning for my PhD, to go broader than that liking and measure, measure the food experience and hope to have a better chance to know more about what actually determines the food choice. So what I have done for that food product experience is first of all measuring the sensory attributes. You can here see an example uh, of how it can be. So there's just a list of different uh, terms uh, and you can ask them if it's applicable that they then say, okay, which, uh, yeah, to which extent a certain yeah, term or sensory attribute is ap applicable. For emotions, it's the same. Also there you can ask which emotions do you experience after consuming this food product. And also there you have certain scales that you can use. So this is an example um, of the essence profile. That was also already a little bit when I did my PhD, how things were going. There was a race in having novel methods using this kind of, uh, yeah, examining the potential of this kind of methods or scales, I would say. So both the sensory has been done, also the emotions, but it was not often combined and you can already see why it is because if you have this for like five to six products, you have lists that are quite long because like here you have only, I think it's 10 emotions. The essence profile that is most often used, it contains uh, almost 40 emotions if you that combine that with again like 20 or 25 sensory terms, that's quite a long list that yeah, participants need to go through. And if you then need to do that for like five or six samples, you'll lose quite some time. So my goal was also to make a tool or develop a tool that combines those two measurements, both the emotions and the sensory but in a user-friendly way. A second improvement that I wanted to do was also to see, okay, to which extent can we try to have evaluations that are more resembling the real consumption context or the real consumption of food products. Because typically in sensory science, you work with that three-digit code for uh, food products. But it also means that yeah, you don't have any information, for instance, of the brand that a certain food product is. So that also means, of course, that can play an important role in how you perceive and how you choose a food product. We know that there's different, uh, yeah, I would say attributes also to food products that play a role. And like brands gives quite some impact. For instance, I start here with example of uh, Coca-Cola. You also have Pepsi here. Um, there's quite a huge um, battle between Pepsi and Coca-Cola for the market share, especially also in the US. And what we know there is that Coca-Cola is a little bit more preferred over Pepsi when it's about the brand because the marketing of Coca-Cola is better. You cannot do, say anything about that, but it's really better. Think about how they were able to introduce even uh, Christmas and link Santa Claus to the Coca-Cola with the food trucks, with the nice lights and so on. Um, yeah, that's something we, we should acknowledge that their marketing is better. And that might also be the reason why they have like a, why there's a bigger preference for Coca-Cola to Pepsi when it's branded. 
but when you have a blind tasting test, and they have performed almost over every two to three years, then consumers prefer the Pepsi Cola. The Pepsi Cola is also a bit sweeter, and I assume that might be the main reason that they yeah, prefer it. But because of the brand, people still have more, um, yeah, more preference for Coca-Cola. But if you do, this, do the sensory test there, and it's just a blind evaluation with three-digit code, people will prefer the Pepsi. So that's a little bit also a lack in how current research often is done. We, we try to do it blindly to see there's no impact of confounding factors. But in the real life, when you put a product on the market, you don't buy just numbers. You buy products, you buy brands, you buy sometimes the whole story of that brand. And that's something I also want to examine a little bit. To which extent does that additional information might play a role when you yeah, choose for food products and when you evaluate them in a sensory point of way. And next to that, I already told you, normally typically research is performed in those sensory boots in the lab. I also performed or also want to go broader than that and also examine the impact of the context and then comparing yeah, the results of a test performed in the lab, but also a lab in a more natural consumption context and then it was easiest to do it at home. Um, so that was also something I wanted to examine. Because a PhD is limited in time and also you need to have focus, I worked with three case studies um, that are most interesting for me. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on then. So for my PhD, I had two objectives. So first of all, developing of a user-friendly method for combining both those emotional and sensory profiling by consumers. That's one thing. On the second hand, studying the potential effects of information and context on consumer food experience. Of course, working with a tool that has been developed but the first overall aim. So my PhD was like a two parts. First, that new tool development and validating that tool and then applying it and three case studies linked to that second uh, aim or ob objective. I'll first drink some water and then uh, I will start with the first objective. So let's start with the first objective, and then after that, I'll give you a break because some people are getting hungry already for the snacks, and I know snacks are quite important here in the Philippines. That's something I've learned already the past week and a half, so. So the new tool I have developed is called the AMO Sensory Wheel because it's a combination of emotions and sensory, so I needed to give the child a name, they would say in Dutch. So it's called the AMO Sensory Wheel, so wheel, it's also because it's like in a real format. Uh, and there has been two studies published about it. The first one is more about the concepts and the ID and testing if it has potential. And the second one is more validation and also to see if it might have an impact on different factors. And also the presentation is also here. I also have looked to give you then a PDF copy of, of the presentation so that you can also spread that for the people that are interested. So what we already had is that we had like long lists, both with sensory terms and also long lists with emotional terms. And besides that, yeah, we didn't have anything to, to make it more convenient for people to, to fill in the questionnaires. Um, so what I thought is because we already had like sensory wheels that are used by a trained panelist, I had the idea, okay, let's think if we can find a way to combine that and to expand those sensory wheels with emotions 
and no longer use it with trained panelists, but with consumers. And so that was a little bit the idea to develop this kind of wheel. Um, and this wheel was then used, I think, for, it was for burgers, because I see like meat aroma, meat taste, and juicy. Um, so it has been then uh, developed specifically for uh, using with, with, with burgers. It has been also developed uh, back at the time in the software uh, that we had and still have. That's the iQuestion software. We can have those, those kind of wheels um, that can be used. And the idea is, okay, people can see it. It's on the computer. So it also means you can see there like uh, this here. They could also spin the wheel, but at the time they still need to use the mouse. Nowadays, it's easier with touch screens. Um, also, that has been updated. So they can also use it just with touch screens and just to spin the wheel and make it easier to read everything. So how does it work? People just see that, they have an instruction, and then they were asked to select either first all the sensory terms or first the emotional terms. It's always a bit randomized, so just only first. And uh, go through it. And there were two options. Either they could just select if something was applicable. So they just clicked on like dry or something else. So here it's creamy. So they clicked on creamy. And it just seemed to confirm that it was applicable. And then uh, the term appeared here. And then the second ter term could be like brown coat I found ap applicable. That was one for chocolate, I think. And then it also gets here. And if they said, okay, sorry, I made a mistake, they could always still remove remove it. And then also for the emotional terms, it's the same. So just each time clicking on it and confirming it's applicable. So that's what we call the check out of apply scale. So just checking if a certain emotion or sensory attribute is applicable. Besides that, there is also the opportunity or the possibility to have the rate all apply. So first, check if it is applicable. Uh, when it's applicable, they rate it. So then they just need to indicate the intensity of uh, the sensory attribute or of the emotion that they have held. So this is an example of, of this then of the rating scale then with, with the wheel. And then it was here for granular, so also for chocolate. And then they need to say if it was only slightly applicable or was it, um, yeah, extremely applicable and to which extent it was a certain number on that scale. So those kind of scales and things are also things that can be programmed in that uh, wheel. Back in the days, it was quite some work to program that. Uh, it was with uh, loading files and trying and doing it things. Uh, nowadays, it's a little bit easier with, with the new tools, um, but uh, it's also with the new methods they work. It's no HTML5, not, no longer JavaScript. There are also different other limitations that are now occurring. Um, so yes. So I set up certain experiments to see if the wheel has potential in the first part of my PhD. A first experiment was with three products, uh, crisps, cola, and chocolate, and to see if we were able to discriminate between the products. So that means um, it's also between different product, food product categories. If people have potato chips, cola, and chocolate, are they able to have different emotions linked with those products. Of course, no attributes, because attributes, sensory attributes of cola, chips, and chocolate, of course, they are different. Uh, I don't think you will say that you have a chocolate flavor when you're consuming uh, cola. So that's something that doesn't exist. So we know that there it will be able to discriminate, but we were not able or we didn't know if we were able to discriminate for the emotions. So that's the first thing that we examined in that first experiment. And the second experiment, a follow-up, experiment was with burgers. So then we worked within a food product category. We also had it blind evaluated, so there was no information foreseen. Um, location here was a laboratory setting. So we had lab and the other one here was on the consumer fair. Um, and there the idea was just, okay, can we apply the sensory, emo sensory wheel? And is it able to discriminate so that you have different sensory terms, but also emotions for those different burgers that were used. 
and there we had a sample size of about 100 participants. You see here also the mean age is quite lower because yeah, if we do things in the laboratory, it's on campus. There's often a huge deal or a huge amount of people that are participating are students, which makes that the average age drops. A third experiment was vanilla pudding. That was also within a product category. Um, two reasons to do that study. Vanilla pudding is normally a product that has less emotions that are evoked. That's at least what we know from literature at the time. And also, I want to have a study that was more yeah, realistic for eating those products, so a consumer fair. I also want to see what the effect was a little bit of information. So a little bit linked tied already to the two second objective. Let's say from the second experiment, if it works well, that we know that we can apply the immosensory wheel to have differences between the products in a blind situation. To which extent can we also go broader and can we also use it to have differences in an informed uh, way and informed us here the brand that was provided to the participants. So let's have a quick look for the results. Uh, don't focus too much on everything is here. I will just uh, tell you the, the key points that you should know. There was a difference in the liking between different products. Crips were highest, were well, in between, but chocolate were highest liked. Cola less, and Crips were a little bit in between. Just from one to nine, so the standard uh, overall liking that was there uh, asked. And then for the emotions, you worked with the RATA, so red apply method. There are just two ways to analyze that kind of scale. One way to analyze it is just to see if it has been checked. And then it's called the RATA analysis, or so just the, the checks, I would say. If you also consider the scores that people gave, for instance, from one to three or one to five, it was one to five here, then the analysis method is RATA scoring. So then if you see the and have we performed analysis and had a look okay for each emotion, to which extent are there significant differences between the different products? Then we saw that the wheel was able to generate about six emotional terms that were different between the different products. So it showed that at least this tool has the possibility to discriminate between products and to see there that there are differences in the emotional profile. So the different emotions that are normally evoked by this by these projects uh, by these products. So then the second step, well, first this also, we also asked uh, how they perceived um, the wheel format if they found it tedious to do the task and also to which extent they found it easy, and globally they found it not really tedious, so they strongly disagree with that, if you see it, strongly disagree, disagree, uh, and also here it's still uh, disagreeing. So the majority of the participants disagree that it was a tedious task. Only a small number of participants found it tedious, and I can say you, yeah, at that consumer fair, because it was performed consumer fair, also people from 80 years older and so on try to do it, but when they needed to work with the mouse, their uh, hand-eye combination was not always that easy, so for them it was uh, not the easiest way to, to answer that question. So for them, it were more, mostly the older people that found it quite a tedious task. And also the easiness, it's also a bit the same, but then the other way around, most people found it quite an easy task or were neutral to that opinion, and some people that were a little bit older often found it a less easy task to perform. But in global, it was quite, the results were quite good. It had potential, so we're able to go to the second experiment and see if the wheel is able to discriminate within a certain food product category, so at the burgers. What you see here are both the emotions. So emotions are listed here, I think until here, until there, and then also here, the different sensory attributes. Here's just about the checks. So it was just about the emotions and the sensory attributes that has been checked. Zero means that nobody checked that emotion or that attribute. 100% means that everybody checked that attribute uh, as or emotion as being applicable. 
For instance, I will take this one because it's quite easy. I think it's uh, granular. So uh, burger B, uh, bur sorry, burger C was perceived as quite granular. Then compared to burger B was in between. And the first one, uh, and the first burger, burger A, was not really considered as being granular. So you see there are different things and different yeah, places, I would say. Every asterisk here means that there was a significant difference between the product samples. So also that means, or so that shows, that the tool has possibility to discriminate for yeah, both the emotional terms, I think, oh, sorry, both for the emotional terms, because there are quite a lot of differences here, and also for the sensory terms, the wheel was able to discriminate. So it also shows that the tool there worked like we hoped for. And then the last experiment with the vanilla pudding, uh, also three different puddings were used. Uh, mean li liking was just yeah, neutral to like slightly, I would say. And also there we see for both emotions and sensory terms that people were able to discriminate between the products. Uh, for the rata, it was quite little. Uh, for the emotional terms, uh, rata scoring a little bit more. Um, I already told you, normally for vanilla pudding, you don't expect a lot of emotions there, so it's also a bit in line with literature that we have little difference there. But for the sensory attributes, there are quite a lot of difference there. And this was the blind evaluation, so just like in the previous two experiments without any information, and this was then performed also at, at uh, a consumer fair. Then you go to the last one here, that was the informed evaluation, and also here we see there were quite some differences here. Um, you see also here, if you compare it, like Pudding B um, was quite a well-known brand. If you give them information about the brand, there's really uh, an increase. I think here it was 5.95, and here it's 6.69, so there's quite an increase in the li uh, in overall liking. And also here, both for the emotional terms and the sensory terms, we had uh, quite some attributes and emotions that were different. Um, also here, if you give a brand, apparently we have some more emotions that were discriminating, so it shows also that a brand can impact the emotions, uh, so there's also some impact there. Also in this experiment, um, we asked for the tediousness and easiness of the task, so performing the task with emotions reveal. And also here, the results were quite good. Most people were finding the task not really tedious, and they mostly found that the task was quite easy to perform in general for most of the participants. Okay, so that was the, the first uh, thing. So with the first part of, uh, I would say from the research, we established that the wheel has potential and it works a little bit like how we think it should work. So we're able to discriminate between product categories, also within product categories, and doing that both in the lab and in a more natural consumption context. And also, yeah, when you give information, we also see that you can also use a tool that it also is able to discriminate between the products. So the tool works and we're able to, to have impacts. Then another experiments were set up to really validate the tool. The first thing to validate is, yeah, to which extent will the tool lead to the same results compared if we, instead of the real format, will work with just the list-based format, so just with the list like how it used to be. So the idea of the tool was not to discriminate more than the list, but just to have a similar result. So we don't want to have more attributes where So that was the first experiment that we set up together with, uh, and we did it for two products. Chocolate on one hand, because we know also that chocolate is quite emotional driven. On the other hand, yogurt, because normally yogurt is not really emotional driven. It's even less emotional driven than a van vanilla pudding. So we expected there that there will not be a lot of emotions evoked uh, when we work with that kind of product. The research design was within subjects um, and 
to, uh, it was each time at 50 participants within subjects. That means that the same participants um, evaluated both the food products with the questionnaire format, so with the, with the emoji or sensory wheel, but also with the list-based wheel. And we also counterbalance that, so that means that half of the participants first used the sensory wheel, and I think about one week later they came back to do it with, uh, with the list-based format, while the other half of the participants first did the list-based format, and then about one week later they came back around the same time to uh, perform it um, with the Emosensory wheel. So that's also balanced there. So there's no impact of uh, the methods that they have done uh, before. A second experiment was to see, okay, what is the impact when you work of when you have the response format? Because you have two different response formats. You have the check out that apply methods, but also the rate out apply. So with the rating added there, and also there you want to see, okay, to which extent does that have an impact? We both, or also opted here to work both with chocolate and yogurt. And here it was a between subjects design, so that means that participants only evaluated the products a single time. So they either were assigned to the study using the check and apply methods, or they were assigned to the study using the rate and apply methods. There are also different uh, subjects for both tests, so it's not that the person of the chocolate also particip participated in the yogurt evaluation, so that there's also different persons that took play, uh, participated in those both experiments. And the last thing that you want to examine is, um, you know that the hydraulic acceptance of or the overall liking is the one that is almost often used. It's always combined normally with emotions or emotional measurements or like the sensory profiling but we wanted to know, okay, if we add that wheel, may, does it may have an impact on the overall liking scores or not? So we also set up an experiment to see, okay, if people use that wheel, have it an impact or doesn't it have an impact? So we worked there both also again with chocolate and yogurt between subject design. So that means that people only participate in a certain tests um, the same people here were also used, of course, for this study, but we have another participants that were added, so they only assessed the samples with just the liking without any emotional or sensory profiling performed by the emosensory wheel. So that was then the last test to see, okay, to which extent does that hedonic assessment is different when or without doing the emosensory profiling and also see if there might have been an effect of the response format which is why we worked both with the kata and the rata response format. Let's go back to the numbers and the results. Um, I'm just focusing here to keep it short um, on the basic uh, numbers, what is most important. Um, for the questionnaire format, um, so the first experiment to see the real versus list-based format, if it has quite similar results. We see it for chocolate, the rata, 13 emotions that were significantly different. For the wheel, it was 14. For list base, it was 14 for the rata scoring and 13 for the rata scoring, so that's quite similar. For chocolate, list base, rata, 6. For the wheel, it was also 6 uh, sensory terms that were different. That are scoring 9 here for the list base and 11 for uh, the rata scoring, so that's also quite similar overall. It looks, based upon these numbers, that it's quite balanced and we have quite similar results and that was also what we aimed for. And when you look for the results for the yogurt, it was the same, especially for the sensory, the same sensory terms were both, were each time like significantly differently. And for emotions, there was only a difference here for the rata, when you use that analysis method, but it was only one term, so you see also here that little emotions were significantly different between the different products. So only one out of, I think, 16, 40 to 16 emoji, uh, emotions. So it's quite little, especially if you compare it with like the chocolate here. So overall, the main take home message of this first experiment was that the list-based format and the wheel-based format provide quite similar results. And that's of course what we hoped for 
because the idea is not that the tool has an impact uh, on how people evaluate the products and what they feel and how they see it. No, the idea was just to make something that's more user friendly and takes lesser time and it's a more nicer task to do than just going through that list-based format, uh, what people sometimes find a little bit tedious to do if they need to do it for quite a long, or quite a lot of samples. Also here are the sample configurations. Um, just to give you the background, you can do also like uh, an analysis on the, yeah, the positioning of the samples in a graphical, yeah, in a graphical way. And what we see there is that RV coefficient is quite high. Uh, if it's zero, it means that it's totally different, and one means that it's totally the same. And for our values, it's quite high, so it's all uh, significant. Significant means that it's significant means not different, but here it means that it's not different at all. So that's good. Um, also, the RV uh, coefficient showed that the sample configurations and also term configurations for the emoji, the da uh, emotional data and the sensory data were quite similar for both uh, yeah, response uh, or analysis methods. It was both for the chocolate and the yogurt. So that also strengthens a little bit the belief that the method uh, doesn't have an impact on uh, yeah, how things uh, go. Okay. Then the second uh, experiment was to see a little bit if the kata on Rata response format had similar results. Uh, and we saw there that for the liking, it's also quite similar. There might be sometimes a little bit of difference, like here you see it, but it's not significantly differently. And also the order is also quite similar when there's a difference like here, it's A, A, B, and here it's also A, uh, A, A, B. So it's quite similar overall. When we look here for chocolates, we see that the Rata format was able to have some more discrimination. So 90% of the terms compared to only 40 terms for the kata. Uh, and also for the century terms, also there, the Rata format was giving a little bit more discrimination than the kata format. For yogurt, emotions. Uh, well, sorry, it's not a discrimination. It's about the terms that were used also for yogurt. Uh, we saw that it's for emotions that less terms were used. Um, about 15%, and also for the data, mainly for the sensory terms, there was also an increase in the use of uh, terms when it was the data format. So apparently, the data format, so if people also need to indicate intensity, they use a little bit more terms uh, to do that. Then for the differences, um, I will give it here both for chocolate and for yogurt. Uh, the results were quite similar for the kata and rata. So you see here 12, 12, 7, 6. And here for yogurt, it was 0, 2, and here 7, 8. So overall, response format doesn't really have a large impact. They use a little bit more terms for when you use normally the rata format. But in the end, it doesn't really make a big difference if you look to this discriminant, uh, yeah or the number of dis discriminating uh, terms, both for emotions and for sensory terms. And then the last study or last experiment of this first one, and then we will have the break. Um, we had a look there, to which extent there might be an impact of yeah, the, wheel, yeah, the wheel format on the liking scores. And when you do that, um, yeah, it seems like it was quite similar so 7.4 for instance, 6.9 and 5.1. It's here again, 7.2, 6.9, 5.0, 5.0, 6.6, 6.6, and 5.2. There are some differences here, but we work with different consumers. So it's also expected that there are some differences there. But the order of, um, yeah, the order of the differences is similar. It's each time A, or almost each time A, B, C, A, B, C. It's A, A, B, but it's quite similar. So it doesn't really have a big impact when you see it like this. And for yogurt, um, it was also quite similar. It's just looking through it. You can also do a, uh, do a yeah, statistical analysis with an ANOVA. So then you make a linear mix model, and when you do that, 
we can here see also that the treatment, experimental treatment, so that's like if they had the hedonic, if they have the hedonic plus the wheel for kata, or hedonic plus the wheel and rata, so this is here then. You know, every time see that's above the threshold of 0 0.05, so there's no impact on it for both, uh, yeah, for both samples, I would say. And for yogurt, it's the same. Also here, the treatment, the p-value is above 0 0.05. And also here, it's above 0 0.05, so there's no impact. Also, when you look for the interaction effects with the sample, you see here it's 0 0.878, so that's also quite good. This is cl coming closer to the threshold, but still above. Here it's also uh, 0 0.2. 0.5 almost, so there's also there no effect. So if you do the whole statistics, it shows also here that the wheel doesn't really have an impact on the hedonic liking, uh, which was also expected because we already knew from previous research that when you work with a list-based version of uh, sensory emotions, uh, sensory or emotions, that it also doesn't impact the liking scores. So it also shows here that our method has potential and that it doesn't really has uh, a bad negative influence <clears throat> on, on other measurements. So over between the emotional and sensory profiles, like we hoped, so the food experience. Overall, we also asked the people <clears throat> when they need to perform both the task with the wheel questionnaire and the list-based format, what they preferred. And two-thirds of the consumers preferred the wheel questionnaire format, so it also shows that it is apparently a little bit better for that. And the overall liking, we also saw that there was no impact. It also shows that it has quite some potential there. So that was it for the first objective. I propose we have no break for, yeah, about 50 minutes if it's fine. So until, let's say, 5 past 11, and then we go further with the second objective. So uh, see you then again, and uh, enjoy your snack, I would say. Thank you so much, Dr. Joachim, for that. The first part of the discussion, okay? According to him, let's have first a short break. You may take your snack or if you wanted to go to comfort room, you may, okay? So in a minute, we'll continue the discussion, okay? Thank you so much. Just a reminder, please be back after 15 minutes, okay? Thank you.
So thank you everyone 
welcome back. Um, let's have a look to start with the second part then, the second objective also from my PhD thesis. So first, in the prior session, we established that yeah, the tool that has been developed works. It has also been been validated, I would say even, that has like similar results, like the list-based uh, use of uh, or examining uh, food experience. So that was an important step. We also showed that it doesn't have an impact on the hedonic liking when it's also assessed uh, together with the sensory wheel. And we also showed, of course, that you can use it to have discriminative profiles, both on sensory parts of so different sensory attributes between different products, but also on emotional parts, so also different emotions that are then is uh, evoked by the products that you can measure that with, with the current tool with the emosensory wheel. So that gives like already, uh, I show you like two parts of my PG, two chapters typically, and I think Sir Joel will acknowledge that. We have uh, at least four research chapters uh, in a PhD in Belgium. So that means four parts, I would say at least. Um, so that meant that yeah, after that, I of course need to do something more. And then the idea was of course to study those effects of potential effects of information, also context on consumers' food experience. So I worked there with three case studies um, about things that were relevant, I think also still relevant at this moment, but also still re uh, relevant at the moment when I conducted those studies. The first one is health-related labels. Of course, yeah, there's always the, the pandemic about uh, obesity. So I want to see to which extent does giving information about health have an impact on how people perceive products, uh, on their acceptance, but also on the emotions and the sensory attributes that they are perceived. A second one was on giving information about content. Content was more about what it has been made of. Later, about uh, later a little bit more about that. And the third study was um, uh, examining brands because really brand is still normally the typical number one decision maker for lots of consumers when they're doing their grocery shore as uh, when they're going grocery shopping. And there, uh, the idea was also to do examine context. So we did a study both at the lab and also on the other hand, both at home with some participants. So let's move forward to the first case study about health related labels. It's also published uh, in Nutrients uh, back in the time and already I think it's seven years ago. So it's a little bit older, but it was in December. So not, not yet seven years. Um, what did we do here? Um, consumers evaluated cheese product, cheese product, just regular Gouda cheese. Um, that's quite a normal kind of cheese that is uh, consumed in Belgium. Normal, so because Gouda, it's officially from like Netherlands, so just our neighboring country, just a little bit above Belgium. And yeah, we, yeah, it's quite a normal product for them. We um, evaluated products twice. So first we asked the people and participants what they expect of the product, both for liking and also for some sensory attributes using the, the wheel and the emotions. Other hand, we also asked them, yeah, when they tasted it, what do they expect also, yeah, how they perceived everything when they actually taste a product. Um, we were a bit naughty, so I think no Santa Claus for me that year. Because while we had different uh, labels, like cheese, light cheese, cheese with reduced salt, and light cheese with reduced salt that we provided to the participants, they were actually tasting the same product. So that means that the, the product was the same, only the label that we provided, and the label was just in the software online, was different. So without knowing, we really examined the impact of the label and not really the impact of the different uh, products because otherwise there might be a bias because of course different products will lead to different sensory attributes and different emotions. And we have done that study also in the lab. So the context is here, sensory lab. So let's have a look to the results. Overall liking, uh, just the expected condition. So that means without tasting. Um, you see here that the control group 
were highest, then light and reduced salt in between, and light plus reduced salt was a little bit lower even for overall liking. Um, here it was measured from one to seven. Um, no, typically it's one to nine, but there was another scale used here because that makes it a little bit easier to compare the results with another study uh, having a similar setup that has been published uh, by people out, out of Australia. So that was expected without tasting. So you see there the differences, and of course that the control group is higher. Then we let people taste the products, and of course they're interesting. Also the hedonic uh, acceptance, what you see there is that the control group, the juice salt, had similar liking scores. So that means if you give the same cheese, but one you label just as cheese, another one as uh, 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 cheese with reduced salt content, then people will like it just in a similar way. But from the moment you label that same cheese as light cheese, the overall liking drops. So that means that by just mentioning that the product is light, light cheese in this case, you can have a drop in over liking and people might like it less, even though yeah, the product is the same. So that's something that was an interesting finding and also a bit in line with the literature. Um, the main reasoning there, just an hypothesis, is of course a cemently thing. Um, when we have light products, we have we link that also to other light products that we have eaten or consumed in the past. And light also have the connotation of lacking something. And often we connect that without knowing it, lacking something that is related to taste and leading to lower taste. So in cheese, light cheese, it normally has typical uh, lower fat content. So we, we expect due to the lower fat content uh, that it should have also lesser good taste. That's at least what, what we uh, thought about of, of it. Then you also have the emotional profiling. We see there for the expected condition without tasting, lots of differences. But from the moment people were tasting, and they were of course tasting also the same product, we only see that there was a difference between one product. So that's like the control with the light, reduced salt, and light plus reduced salt. It's something that can be expected because normally, typically, the emotions are quite driven by the sensory properties of the product. And because the sensory properties were quite the same, because it was the same product, um, it's quite normal then that we have little differences in the emotions. Although some, yeah, if you have a look, the percentages did differ, like here, for instance, for, um, I think it's uh, good. 50% for instance for uh, reduced salt, control group and light uh, weight uh, and uh, light and reduced salt was here and then uh, light here was only at 40%. So there are differences, but statistical wise, not significant. So it doesn't matter too much. That's the emotional part. Then the sensory profiling, also there expected. So without tasting, people expect differences there between the products. And when we did the actual tasting, interesting, they were the same products. We find difference for untasty. We can link that, of course, to the overall liking scores. Creamy can be linked to the yeah, light, so less fat, so less creamy. And salty, of course, we had the question of light salt. So people had the ID, because it was the same cheese, that if we just perform like light cheese, that less is less creamy. So that's really also interesting. So just in their mind where they make up that they perceive a lower intensity of creaminess just by yeah, the fact that it's labeled as light cheese. When it's like reduced salt or light and reduced salt, it's a little bit in between. And for salty, it's the same, um, the control was here, light was also a little bit in between, and also the reduced uh, light and reduced salt was also quite lower. So you see they're also linked with the results. It has an impact that people are perceiving things a little bit differently based upon yeah, the labels that you provide. But for the other attributes, there was no impact. 
So it seems that the labels are really related to normally the taste, overall taste, like untasty or creamy salty, which are linked to the, the experiments and the labels we gave them. That was the first case study. Second case study was about uh, insects, plant and meat-based burgers that we worked with. Um, back in the time, 2015, 16, we saw the first um, products on the market in Belgium made of insects. So they were hitting the stores quite uh, surprisingly. Uh, but also those products were within one year also all, all of the stores because after people just tried it at once, it was nice to first try it once. But they were not that keen of that those products. They're also quite uh, expensive. Um, so yeah. So this is a study. I think it's still my most uh, cited study at at the moment, um, examining uh, so the uh, the effect of um, yeah information information about yeah what it has been made of. So I provided the, the information if it was either plant based, a uh, meat based or a burger made with insects. That was information that we gave. And we evaluated that again under a blind evaluation here. So without any information, so just with the digit code, then expected, expected just giving information without tasting. And in the last step, so that was in a couple of weeks later, an informed session was held. So they had three digit code, but together with three digit codes, they got information about yeah, what it has been made of. So those were consumers, about 100 consumers participated in this test. Um, a small tip here, um, people need to come back because of those different conditions. Uh, and always, yeah, if you have tests, and that's what I've learned also then, uh, as there's always a kind of a dropout. So people don't always come back. So we, we, I think we recruited about 110 participants, but in the end, only 97 completed everything. So always consider that there will be a dropout of 10 to 20 percent when you're working with different sessions and people need to come back. Um, it can be that they forget about it, they're sick, there are other reasons, but just consider that, that you start initial recruitment with a little bit more participants. In general, when you want to have something scientifically for sensory, they expect at least 100 participants in total for a study. If you have different conditions, so uh, between subject design, at least 50 particip participants for each condition is deemed as yeah, the lowest uh, standard, I would say. Um, I think most of the information has been given. Uh, the context here was the sensory lab, so everything took place at our lab at the faculty. I focus here on the liking scores first. The burger, meat-based, it was just an ordinary burger, not the best ones, but one that is often sold, used as a hamburger. So between, besides the patty, also sold the sandwich bread between, and some, uh, yeah, some vegetables and so on. Plant-based were just was also just from the supermarket, and then you had insect-based that was also uh, bought from a local dealer uh, in our neighborhoods. Uh, so blind informed, what do we see? The meat-based overall liking was quite high, or quite high, quite uh, the highest. Uh, so it was measured from one to nine. So it was above the median or the, the average of five. So that's already quite good. Um, and informed, it's a little bit better even than, than uh, when they, there was a blind evaluation. The plant-based goes a little bit higher, but also the insect-based, surprisingly, it was not really appreciated that much when you did it blind. But then formed, okay, it's still below the average of five, but it's already better. So it seems like, okay, although it, they don't really like it, it's better when they have the information that has been made with insects. So there's already something that apparently the insects gives it a higher value and they appreciate it, or at least some parts of the consumers, because these are averages, appreciate it more when they know that's uh, from uh, insects made. And that difference is also significantly, so that means that it's also a significantly improvement uh, of that uh, overall liking score. Then the emotional profiling, 
Um, I just focus here on, on some uh, yeah, terms because it's not always easy to put everything there. But uh, just so you have an idea here, um, what did we see overall? Um, that on one hand, when there was a blind evaluation that the meat based was like a separate emotional profile, while the plant based and the sick based profiles were quite similar also uh, on emotion level when you have the blind evaluation. When you then have the informed evaluation, I think there's something wrong here also, but yeah. We see there that the plan base is a little bit more getting in between the meat based and the insect based. So apparently by giving information about the, yeah, where it has been made of, the plan base moves a little bit more into the direction uh, for emotions that are evoked to the meat based and go a bit further away from the insect base. For instance, if you look for contented, but here has 10, I think 10 people or 10 persons that has indicated it. It's here already 23. So you see there that there are some differences. Also for GLAD, um, meat based 16. Here it goes from four to eight and here it's even uh, declines from three to two. So you see the plan base goes for certain emotional terms more into the direction of the meat base. So there's a kind of a shift but giving information uh, about what it is. Then for, oh, I don't know where, the, where does this here back? I think there's a small hiccup. The sensory profiling, what we see here is already for sensory, sensory profiling in the blind thing is that we again have the same thing a little bit like for the emotions. On one hand, you have the, uh, the sensory profiling from the meat based, it's so like on its own. And the plant based and insect based, they're sometimes similar, sometimes different, but there's like more similarity between them compared to the meat based profiling. So that's good. And also here, when you do the inform thing, you see that the plant based but emotions is getting a little bit more into the direction of the meat based. Uh, and it's getting more there. If you have the statistical analysis performed, you can see it that the letters are getting more in common here compared to the previous uh, parts. That's it in short uh, for the second case study. Maybe also for the second case study, I didn't put too much focus on it, but we also saw that the meat burger was like more associated with positive emotions while the plant-based and the insect-based burger were more associated with negative emotions. So that's also something that we have seen there and it also indicates a little bit that the consumers were not that happy with the products. I won't say that they were not ready at that moment to consume it, but it was really that the products themselves were not that uh, appreciated uh, at the moment. And then the last um, study, the one uh, yeah, about the brand information and also about the context. Uh, consumers evaluated their five samples of yeah, strawberry yogurts three times. We used strawberry yogurt in the hope that we had a little bit more differences on emotional level compared to plain yogurts because there might be still some differences there. So also here, three times the evaluation, just like the previous study, blind expected information blind was with no information and tasting. Expected, you give them information, but they don't taste anything. And in the informated condition, they got information and they also tasted the products. We worked with two premium brands. Danone, it's quite popular in Belgium because it's also a French brand and Pure Nature. Pure Nature is also, you see here, bio, so it means that it's organic. So I used those two brands a little bit to to end the study to play with it. And then we had also three private label brands, one from every major uh, supermarket chain that was at that moment present in, in Belgium. So every day from Koreit, 365 is from Deleuze and Carrefour, it's from a Carrefour market. So at that moment, there were the three uh, uh, yeah, biggest supermarket chains. And so that's why the, that's the reason we have chosen those private label brands. And only five samples, it's a little bit the maximum that we have seen as the optimum to recruit participants and really to, to, yeah, to have meaningful data. 
we worked with the lab and home testing, and uh, sadly, yeah, we get we got a little bit of difference between them. Uh, Fifty-three persons that's in the lab, forty-six that's home. Um, it was easier to have the people yeah, coming back at the lab, surprisingly, than uh, having them participating each time at home. So some people did not always fill in all the questionnaires. So yeah, okay, that's those are things that are happening. Um, but it's just, yeah, in the end, we almost uh, ended up with 100 participants in total. So it was still able, we were still able to, to publish it. Overall liking scores here, um, both blind and formed. You have here the lab and the home use results. P1, P2, P1 means premium one, and P2 means premium two. PL1 means private label brand one, private label brand two private label brand three. And you see here, what is really interesting is during the blind at the lab, we have differences in the blind evaluation, but not an informed evaluation. While when you work at home, it's the other way around. So at home, there was no significant difference in the overall liking scores for the brands, uh, for the products, when they were evaluated blind, so it's just three-digit code. But when they were doing it at home, there were differences noticed uh, in the overlaking scores. So it seems that at least for the overlaking, there is a kind of an effect of where it takes place. This is also a bit in line with literature. So literature has already shown that there might be a context effect, but the effect is not always that clear. Uh, so it can be sometimes, depending on the condition, uh, what is happening. We can only think or hypothesize that at home, People are also more influenced by the people surrounding them. And that might have led there to more yeah, significant difference in the overlapping scores. While in the lab, <clears throat> the first time they know they're more aware that it's an experiment. And that might be the reason why the first time they were more going to into deeper to the products. But the second time when they know there are different brands and they might be maybe a little bit biased because it's an experiment, they had there was less difference between the different uh, lack and scores of the different products. Then for emotional and sensory profiling, um, what did you see there? Blind, expected, and informed. We saw in the lab five emotional terms and the blind evaluation with the were significant different. At home, only one. Expected in the lab 10, home four and a foreign condition in lab two and home zero. So it shows that when people are in the lab, it appears that people are then also more different evoked, different emotions might be evoked there, or it can be that they are doing the tests more, yeah, more in depth and they are experienced there a little bit other things also because it's more an experience there compared to when they do it at home. And for the sensory terms, in the blind condition also there, eight uh, sensory terms that are significant differently. So it means that for eight terms, there were differences between the different products. Uh, while at home, it was only for four. Expected a bit similar, eight to five. And informed, uh, when you do the informed session, apparently then it catches up. So then the home tests, there were even more significant difference for sensory attributes than at the lab. So it looks like it can be interesting if you're doing research um, at a certain moment, uh, and especially if you want to do it like for food products that will be on the, sup uh, on the supermarket, to give the information and also to try to do it more in a realistic environment because then you can see that there are really th different uh, experiences, so mainly for the sensory but less for the, uh, for the emotions. So that is something that we can take home here. Some general conclusions. Um, for my PhD, we found that the real, emotions real is a consumer friendly and also a validated tool for combining emotional and sensory profiling. We also saw that combining those both emotional and sensory profiling can provide some new insights, both for the food industry and for food scientists, of course. 
we saw that information has an impact on the sensory profiling, but when you gave information, there was not so much impact on the emotional profiling, so the it was yeah there wasn't really a shift in the number of significant different terms uh, for emotions then, but more for sensory terms. And context, uh, we saw that the context was primarily having impact on the emotional profile and less on the sensory profile when they were tasting the samples. So that was from the last study. Okay. That was a little bit about my PhD. I have also a couple of slides still about my current research, um, mainly focusing here on the things that I'm yeah, working on that are building a bit further on my PhD. So um, after the, the wheel, um, something else became more and more popular uh, when we think about emotions, and that's emoji. I think everybody quite knows them quite well. So I've set up quite some studies already to examine the potential of using emotions and food science as like an alternative uh, for measuring yeah, emotions with words. Um, there are a couple of studies I will highlight here just to show you and to show also the potential of, of doing it. Uh, the first one is this one where we really showed that you can use emoji with children. Well, uh, the most number of studies has been performed with using emojis with adults. I think it's quite an interesting tool for children, especially for younger children, because they're not they're always able to read already. So it can be that they are, it's easier for them to work with emojis understanding sometimes difficult uh, words uh, and also the words are not always that easy to, to work with. Well, the emojis are more easy, I think, for them to interpret and to understand their meaning. Uh, so um, this first study, we worked with about 150 children. It took place uh, at their schools, uh, at their schools because of the trusted environment they're more at ease there compared if you want to try the same thing uh, at a lab environment. But also, and it's an other reason that you cannot always mention uh, when you were to do a scientific publication, but it's quite easier to collect the data at school than if you need to have all the people coming to your lab. So it's more efficiently also in a time-based manner to do it there uh, at, uh, at school, uh, at the canteen. They evaluated five samples of Spiculose biscuits. Um, it's also currently marketed uh, the main brand as Biscoff. Um, and it was a blind evaluation, so they didn't get any information about the brands. There were two premium brands that we used and three private label brands in this uh, study. What were the main results? We saw that, uh, or we found that emoji has led to different emotional profiles. So that's interesting especially because yeah, we worked with the same product samples so yeah, with us, uh, or product samples of the same food category. Um, what we also saw that emoji profiles were primarily discriminating based upon the emotional balance. So the emotional balance is from positive to negative. So that's the main reason how people or how the children were discriminating the samples. So samples that had like a higher overall liking also were more associated with positive emojis, while samples with the lower liking were to a lesser extent uh, yeah, associated with those po uh, positive emoji and more associated with more negative uh, balanced emojis, like the, the face with, uh, tearing, uh, with tears and so on. Also quite interesting, and you are the first one to show that, was that if you add emoji, data that you were able to better predict the actual food choice of children. So when these experiments, as a gift, uh, children were able, well, as a gift, they were able to choose one sample that they want to get, take home with them. So that was as a gift given for them to see it as a participation. But they didn't know that we also registered that gift and we also linked it to their data. And that gift can also be seen as a certain food choice that they have made because they need to choose between different products. We didn't ask for a preference because with preference, we don't get anything in return. But this giving it as a gift 
it's really a choice that they need to make that will be more deliberately than if you just say, okay, what's your preference? They can just take something, but there's no value added uh, on it. So we examined there what was the added value of yeah, that data, also for the food choice. Um, and we show here, and you can see it here at the first bar. First bar is just the liking data. So that's the standard condition, I would say. There you're able to about, to predict about 62%, I think, something like that, of the food choice. Well, if you have liking plus the first principle, principle component based upon those emoji data added, you're able to predict about uh, 65, 66% uh, of the yeah, of the food choice, and it's the same if you also add the second uh, principal component. It's only a small increase, but of course, if you think about the number of products that are launched every year, it's also quite an interesting increase, especially if you're like a big manufacturer uh, or a big multinational brand launching a lot of different products. So that can make totally a difference. And if you have it just as data on its own, so PC1 or PC1 plus PC2, that's here below, you're not able to predict better than the food, uh, than the liking, so that has less value. So this is the first study, and I think until today, still one of the only ones that also shows that that emoji data has an added value beyond liking to predict food choice. So that's the modeling part, and for that we, I had a colleague at my university that helped to set those up, but uh, about that modeling, that is uh, not uh, something I can do. The second study here um, was comparing standardized and product-specific emoji lists. So also here, children also having five samples of Spiclose biscuits. We now didn't work with different brands, although it was also blind here, we worked with different uh, Spiclose biscuits, which had a different yeah, content, I would say. So three were based upon wheat. One was made of whole wheat and one was multigrain. Also testing took place here at school and they also didn't have any information about uh, the brands or whatever. So for emotion research, what you had when you work at words and also then for emojis, but you had like standard lists that you can use based upon prior research. So it's like a longer list that you can use for all kind of products. But besides that, you can also try to make a list specifically for a specific product. So that means that first you will test like a longer list with like a sample of about 20 participants to narrow down that huge list and like more lower list. So you have like, this is one list, but there are also different other lists. So you have like then a huge list of like 50 to 60 emojis that you can have. And then we were able to narrow that down to like a list of about 20 emojis. We also see that some of those emojis are not here in the standard list, so they are also taken from another standard list, uh, I think from uh, Sarah Yeager. So like the, the heart symbol and those uh, hands uh, were not in this standard list that has been used previously with, with children from Gallo. So children were evaluating the products um, either with the product specific list or with the standard list. And then we turn it around, uh, I think a couple of weeks later on with the same samples. Um, what we saw there also was that both lists didn't really have an impact on the overall liking scores. That's also important because it has not been examined before uh, to see if there was an impact. So it's also good that uh, just like with the emosensory wheel, it doesn't impact over liking scores because it's quite an impact measurement that we have. And we also saw that there was no interaction effect of the method and the samples, which means that also the, how do you call it, the order of the liking scores are normally, is normally the same, which you can also see here that the ordering is quite similar with the letters that are here about the significant differences. And then for the scannability, I don't sh show you the results in detail. Just know that the emojis that are still visible, those were discriminating between the different samples. When there's like a cross over it, that emoji was not able to discriminate between the different uh, five speak biscuits. So what do you see here? 
is that when you work with the product specific lists, you have a lot more emojis that are discriminating compared to when you work with the standard list, at least when you're doing that kind of research with, with uh, children. Later on, we did it also with adults, and there the results were quite similar, so there it showed, or it can also be product depending, that there was not really an advantage of working with the product specific list, except that it's shorter, so it also means that participants need less time, so they can also have been less bothered by the task. I think that might be the reason, at least for children, they might get annoyed a little bit earlier than adults, and they might prefer like uh, doing this in a shorter with a shorter list. It's a little bit easier for them to to go through. It makes things shorter. So uh, there has, or they often also have a lower attention span than adults. Okay, and then I'm here with the last study that I want to present you shortly. It's uh, the valence and arousal circumplex, circumplex inspired emoji. Uh, so what already ex existed was this kind of, I won't say a wheel, it's called a circumplex. And this is based upon the psychology. So in psychology, they already have this kind of circumplex, circumplex but each time it's like two terms, a word pair uh, at several axes. The first axis here the, is more about being active. So that's a high arousal. Well, on the bottom, it's passive or quiet, which is low arousal. When you go left, it's unhappy, dissatisfied, which is negative valence. And on the right side, it's happy, satisfied, which is high valence or positive valence. So that means here, it is uh, circumplex. You have each time different steps, a little bit in between on the line, each time for arousal and for um, for the valence of uh, yeah, emotions, I would say. So this already existed. Uh, and I had the idea, OK, this is quite interesting. But why not try to set something up also with emojis? So then I contacted uh, Dr. Sarah Yeager from New Zealand. New Zealand, uh, I think it's the Institute for Plant and Food uh, Research that she's working on. And I started up a collaboration with her to examine the potential for developing also some such kind of uh, circumplex, but then based upon emoji. What did we do there in order to get there? Um, so it's also a more methodological study that we have done. We let adults from the United Kingdom evaluate emojis to see, okay, which emoji is the best for replacing each word pair. So we have the 12 word pairs based upon the word-based yeah, circumplex. And then we added for each yeah, word pair a number of emojis that we already know based upon previous research. research. That's quite interesting to work with and that might be a good uh, yeah, yeah, candidate to replace that word pair. So it was six, so that's an example of six. Other word pairs were up to eight, uh, sorry, up to 11 emojis. They also have the opportunity to say, okay, none of these emojis are, according to me at least, a good rep representation of then the terms secure at ease. Just to give you an example of how the result looked like, so for each word pair, we had then the different emojis that were good. And then you had a percentage of yeah, emojis or participants that said, okay, this is a good candidate. They were only able normally to select one thing. So they really need to select what they thought that was the best candidate. And for instance, for energetic, excited, Star Trek was number one, 29%. So we used that then to go further with. And in the end, we then composed this kind of um, circumplex. And a second step then, but I don't think I have the slides here about that. We then also applied it and uh, did the study, a large scale study to see to which extent can this circumplex be applied to 15 foods and beverage names. And is it able also to discriminate again between those foods and beverages regarding their emotions, but on using the, yeah, the circumplex with emojis. Okay, 
that was it from my side. I think I'm still within the time of before 12 o'clock, just 10 minutes over. Thank you so much, Dr. Yua Chim, for that informative talk about sensory analysis, explicit and implicit aspects of food experience. This is very useful, especially to our students from College of Engineering and Food Sciences. And also, this is useful to all the uh, research enthusiasts, okay? Because when you want to conduct a research, so uh, the information we've learned earlier is very useful, okay? So do you have any query or clarifications to our speaker? He is very willing to answer. Am I right, sir? Okay. Asa, ma'am has a question. Yes, ma'am? Hello? Okay, this one also works. Thank you so much, Joachim, for such a great lecture and such a wonderful sharing for all of us. I hope our students have a colorful morning. Tama ba? <laughs> so my question is, because we are in uh, a third world country like that and our facility is not that much, can we do this uh, sensory wheel without uh the computer assisted thing i think um you can try to make it like on paper and ask I them see. then to just yeah rating will then be hard of course you can always ask them yeah. to write a number on it but you can also ask them to select it so that's a way to go to do it on paper so i think that's like the circumplex i showed you it's normally also to be done on on paper even yeah. so it's something you can do but of course you need some more um skills there for drawing and to make sure that uh, it looks nice um, yeah. i think the excel stats software is sometimes used also for um for analysis it also has like a kind of a module to develop wheels or sensory wheels so uh, that's something you can also use instead of the software so some somewhat like it's only applicable on the check all the data mm -hmm. but, but but the rata it will be difficult i think you can also ask them that they then write, for instance, the intensity next to it if they find something applicable. I think that's another solution to, to do it. <laughs> okay. But of course, um, yeah, there are also some limitations. Like here, yeah. everything is alphabetically. Um, you can maybe also randomize things uh, with the wheel. At that moment, when I did my PhD, it wasn't possible. I should look it up if it's now possible because I have moved a little bit more forward with emojis nowadays. Um, so there are also limitations, of course, to each study and which approach you choose. The, the emojis are very, very cute, very cute instrument. And uh, because our university has this um, food blend for the zero to, I think, six years that we are, we are selling to LGUs. And that will be a good instrument, I think for us to know whether the recipients of the feeding program really like the, uh, those food items or not. So thank you so much, Joachim, and thank you, Pak. Do you still have question or clarification to our speaker? Don't hesitate to raise your hand if you still have. And that she say, don't be shy, I don't bite, so. <laughs> I also won't bite here, so. Do you still have question? Yes, ma'am. Good noon, sir. Uh, actually, I am not into food research, but I am so amazed of what you have presented to us today, especially when the children is going to be the respondents. It's only now that I have 
known and realized, ah, pwede pal it, it, that the moticons can be possibly used for for uh, uh, conducting yeah. the experiment for children. Yeah. And it amazed me a lot. So, uh, does, does these emoticons can also be used, like, for example, uh, if your respondents are uh, aged, young, yeah, we, we have done some research with adults also, so it's not a problem to toss with adults. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for that question. Do we still have some more? Uh, yes, ma'am. So, um, I'm just curious with regards to, uh, by the way, our students, you can ask questions, especially that they will be, they will be conducting their under, undergraduate thesis this coming semester or school year. Yeah. We can interpret in English your question. <laughs> I'm curious about uh, the degree of giving information to, for the products. I mean, what are the necessary things that we need to inform the panelists when you say inform uh, condition. So, Thank you. Yeah, in order to make it as easy and as, yeah, I'm going to say it's as easy as possible. Oh, there's something going down there. <laughs> okay, um, in order to really have a good experiment, it depends a bit on what you want. You can do it really realistic and like work with the whole package. Of course, if you have the whole package, you don't know if it's the brand, the nutrition content, how something looks, but it's really affecting things. So there are some studies that then have worked with like the same packaging, often from like a fake, I would say, a brand, um, and where it's just a certain thing uh, adapted. For me, because I didn't have a graphical designer in my team, <laughs> uh, I just make it easy and I just like for instance the questionnaire show the brand logo when it was uh, about the brand when it was about the nutrition co uh, content I just mentioned it what it was made of and nothing like that so I didn't provide the whole ingredient list or something like that because there might be too much information I don't also don't know if they really what well, it might be that triggered it. it can be that's not the the meat or if it was vegetable based or yeah, plant based can also be the sugar content or something else that was different. So, and then for the other one, um, the brand with the cheese, there's also just um, written down uh, in the questionnaire and uh, yeah, and the online survey what was the information. So it was just like okay, it's like it's cheese, it's cheese with a reduced salt content, it's light cheese or the combination. So not more information than that, and just between brackets. Um, or between brackets, just next to the three digits code that they had for the samples. So I didn't provide any more information on that because yeah, otherwise it's hard to know which information has triggered the response. So it's really about setting a good experiment. It's really about focusing what we want to examine to make sure that you yeah, have the right thing that you want to measure also and the right uh, effect that you want to examine or study. Thank you so much, Joe. You're okay. How about to the group of the students? Do you still have questions? Please don't be shy. Especially that you will be conducting your undergraduate thesis. You know, earlier I can relate because in our university, I am um, a panel member every time that the students will be presenting their thesis. And I am a member of the panel in the food technology. Then we used um, the survey questionnaire uh, we use five Likert scale in the sensory analysis, especially in the organoleptic evaluation of the food that they are going to, to conduct research from. So we usually use um, questionnaire or survey questionnaire in assessing the...
it a format. So I think both methods are possible. For the kata format, you cannot do ANOVA because you just have like a percentage. Um, so there's like an other kind of statistics you need to do there. I don't know it by, by heart. I think it's the McNamara and the Cochrane Scoot test, depending on how many samples you have. But those are things you can look up. If you work with the scales, if you have the rate of scale, normally this need to say if it's applicable, yes or no, and if it's applicable from one to three or one to five, um, then you may say if it's not applicable, that's zero, that's already proven, it can say that, or compare it to zero, and if you say it's like a two, then it's just the two, and then you can have the averages and just the regular ANOVA, like you do with, with, yeah, with other tests, with uh, liking scales. Okay, sir, is this, is there, um most applicable statistics to use in that type of test of the emoji test um, well, it's just ANOVA otherwise the yeah the non parametric test uh, uh, if you have just the cutter scale so it's one of those two so that's the easiest way to okay. how it's to be done. used on that kind yeah. of scale okay sorry thank you Paul. do we still have question i guess none sir Thank you so much again, sir, for that insightful and interesting discussion we had this morning. Okay. Thank you. Again, let's give a round of applause to Dr. Yuashim. Thank you. You may take your seat, sir. This time, let us welcome Dr. Jennifer M. Ibonia, the Dean of the College of Engineering and Food Sciences, to give us the closing remarks. A round of applause, please. Thank you, Ms. MC. Uh, I'm not Mom Jen <laughs> so, in all aspects, but our dean has a, an important uh, trip. Uh, she is in a, an official business uh, trip to Luzon. I mean, to Los Manos for their benchmark for the offering of MS Abe. So I'll take her place to say uh, thank you very much, Dr. Joachim Shautet-Teten. Uh, I hope I, a, a little bit right, <laughs> a little bit right pronunciation of your name. And then, as I've said earlier, you really give uh, so much color for us in understanding the sensory evaluation, especially that uh, we have seen how you brought signs really to the consumers. And uh, we were amazed since yesterday of all your sharing and uh, we pictured out how passionate and how hardworking you people from Ghent University are. And thank you so much for allowing us to learn so much from your expertise. Thank you for choosing our university. We know how hard it is to be here. Uh, it's extremely on the opposite <laughs> for, for a lot of things. Thank you for bearing our weather conditions and, of course, the Philippine setup. So for our dear students, I do believe that you've learned a lot from our expert. And we, we hope and pray that uh, we all become as passionate as Dr. Ten for applying the sensory evaluation concepts and principles in helping our village people, especially the household processors, which are the main players in this um, project of ours in partnership with Ghent University as well as Vleros. Uh, thank you so much also, Ma'am Live and Sir Joel for being with us this three days of the, the important event for our Kakao Festival. For all of you, for all the faculty members, and for the organizing team, for the VPRI family, thank you for spending so much effort in making this 
uh, festival a success. To all of you, happy lunchtime. And let's again give a round warm of applause for our expert. Thank you, Ms. MC. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think we are all good now. To our source speaker today, Dr. Yuashim, thank you so much again, sir. And to all our participants in this seminar, our sincere thanks to all of you. We could not, we could not have done this successfully without your presence, okay? Uh, your presence to join us today. We hope to see you again tomorrow, okay? Okay, thank you so much again. Announcement, you can get your lunch at the registration area at the same time, your certificates, okay? Uh, yes, uh, sir, is it all right if we can have a photo opportunity from you? Okay, so can we gather here? Okay, okay. So please stand up, our participants, and let's form here for the photo opportunity. So our faculty members, deans, you can come in front po. To our cacao growers, cacao experts, students, you can also come with us for the picture taking. Please join us also. Pwede po kayo, Sir Tumayo. Okay lang po. You can remove your face mask for the picture taking, okay? Okay. Once again, thank you so much. I will have one more phone. Okay. Okay, one more. Again, thank you so much, everyone, and see you all tomorrow. Thank you, Po. I would like also to thank the extension uh, personnel. Thank you so much, Sir Marvin and Mamzai. So God bless everyone.